And now we get to uh, listen to Dr. Sharon Flynn. Um, I'm assuming Sean is not joining us today, <laughs> talking to us about the Intutor, Intutor project. You're, you're going to do fine all by yourself. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's been a fantastic conference. I have really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for, uh, for turning up here today. <laughs> We've got a, a small group, but I have been talking to various people about the Intutor project over the last couple of days, so um, thank you for being here. I'm going to preface this presentation with a personal note, because I learned from the, the first keynote this morning. Um, 13 days ago, I tested positive for COVID. Um, I didn't think I would actually make it here. I've been pacing myself, but that's just to explain that I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm inarticulate. So it's just a, a you know, forgive me sort of a notice. On top of that, because I have asthma, I've spent the last four days on steroids. So despite being exhausted, I haven't slept and I'm slightly hyper. So again, forgive me. The last thing I want to mention, and I really thought about, am I going to say this or not? It's my birthday. Oh. So, so here I am on my birthday presenting to you lovely people. <laughs> Fantastic. Sean's not here. He wanted to be here. He may well be watching, I, I, I don't know, but I, I do have some lovely colleagues here from MTU who are sitting up the back and they'll also be able to answer questions that I can't. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a bit about the NTUTOR project. So this is, this is, we're in the middle of the, the project, so this is a really very kind of factual, what is it, more than anything else. And, you know, maybe, maybe next year I'll come back and talk about lessons learned, um, because I am certainly learning plenty and plenty of lessons. So um, the, the specific details. Um, so it's a, it's a project within Ireland, um, uh, within the Republic of Ireland, and uh, the last line of the slide there, it's, it's a collaboration between seven higher education institutions in the, the technological sector. Um, it's funded from European money under the Next Generation EU scheme, um, the Resilience and Recovery Fund. And the Irish government chose to invest almost 40 million euro um, in a two-year project um, and, and to put that money into the, the technological sector, which is absolutely fantastic. One thing that you may not be aware of um, within Ireland is that that sector has been in a, a phase of transition, huge transition, over the last couple of years. So this is sort of change upon change. Um, you know, a number of years ago, we would have had 13 or 14, depending on how you count them, um, institutes of technology. We now have got five technological um, universities, which have been formed by amalgamating former IOTs together. And then we still have two IOTs that, that haven't amalgamated. Um, so our seven partners are um, ATU, um, Atlantic Technological University. We have um, Dundalk IT, which is still an institute of technology. We've got Dunleary Institute of Art, <coughs> Design and Technology. We have MTU, Munster Te Technological University. Colleagues up the back. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, the Southeastern Technological University. We've got TU Dublin and we have the Technological University of the Shannon. So those are our seven partners. Um, the program, the, 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 the program as a whole, um, has been designed, and I use that word very loosely, designed, apologies, Garode, um, <laughs> to transform learning, teaching, and assessment in that sector. Um, and uh, I'll come on to the, the, the streams in a moment, but there are three broad streams um, to it. So number one, the stream one is focusing on students and empowering students. Number two is developing staff capabilities and, and also looking at curricular development. And um, stream three is around um, the digital ecosystem. And uh, Garod, who is going to be the host of OER um, in March next year, um, is actually our, one of our stream three leads. So he's, if you want to talk about that, developing the ecosystem, he's the man to talk to. Um, is that everything I wanted to say there? Um, but let's just move on and I'll catch up with myself. Okay. Yes, the design of the program. Um, the design of the program is based around six core themes. And you recognize all of these from the, you know, the, the current narrative around teaching and learning and, and education. So the six core themes are um, academic integrity, 
big issue at the moment and lots of talk, particularly at this conference, around um, AI and how it is impacting on academic integrity. Universal design for learning, um, there, there are some quite big projects that are happening in Ireland um, in parallel to the NTutor project, which we are leaning into and learning from. Um, EDI, Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion, uh, is a big one. Employability, which is really within the student stream. Um, education for sustainability. Um, and um, digital transformation and teaching and learning. And as you can see, all of those, they overlap. They're not separate themes. They're, they're all interlinked and interwoven. Um, and it's a nice space. It's a nice palette to work with. Thank you, Donna. Um, so so it's, it's quite good. But, but the reason that I'm talking about this loose design is when I started in this role, which was in November, and I should just say that the project, the programme started, the clock started ticking in April last year, so April of 2022. I started as the national coordinator in November. So there'd been already quite a bit of time had elapsed. Not a lot had happened at that stage beyond talking and discussing. But the number of people I met in the first week who said to me, uh, Sharon, um, you really need to understand how all of this came together. From my understanding, and Garode can, can confirm or otherwise, basically a group of people from across the sector were all brought into a room early on and that they may have been um, added to um, at different times, people coming in and out. But essentially, this program was designed over the course of a month by seven partners, mm. um, all wanting to sort of include their own things, their own, you know, priorities, what they wanted to do. So I'm not going to say that we have got a coordinated program of work, but we are working towards that. And what is exciting is the, um, I suppose, the willingness of all of the partners to work together and the recognition that they do want to work together and they do want to collaborate and share their experiences and learn from each other and move forward together. Um, rather than operating as seven separate institutions. So that gives me a lot of hope and a lot of confidence. And I have to say that I am really enjoying the experience because I am new into this sector um, myself. And as I say, I'm just learning so much. Let me tell you a little bit about the, the government's governance and management. So this is an EU project. So you can imagine the amount of, of governance that's going on. Um, I sit within what's called the Technological Higher Education Association. There is a huge amount of politics involved in that, which I'm just not going to go into because it would take me about an hour to explain it. Um, but essentially, that's where I am. So I'm in the, the program management office, um, which you'll see is the kind of green circle up, um, up there. I've got a small team around me, so I've got a finance guy. Thanks be to God. <laughs> I have got, um, I've got a, a, a sort of project coordinator who's, um, who, who does a lot of the, the heavy lifting with me. I've got an admin assistant for the first time ever. That is so exciting. Um, I'm not really quite sure what to do with her, but she's fantastic. Um, and um, we also have got um, a communications manager, um, which was absolutely essential to have within the project. Hadn't been planned, but had to have her there. Um, so that's our, our program management office, and we also um, depend on some of the resources within the Technological Higher Education Association as well. Then if I was to go um, from left to right, um, and we go into the institutions, within each institution then there's a, a sort of a, a program management team. So each institution has got an institutional lead who's been recruited into, this is a full-time role, an institutional lead for their institution, and they actually form part of the steering board, which is the pink circle up there. And we meet once a month, we meet physically once a month, we have these mammoth steering committee meetings, which last at least six and a half hours, and they're, they're, they're difficult. And, and even at that, I mean, Garode had to chair one recently, and it's, it's a challenge, right, Garode? It's, right. There's a lot of talking, um, and everybody wants to be heard. Um, but within their institution then, they have got teams, so other people have been employed because we, we, we've, got, we've got a huge amount of money, to be honest with you. So um, within each institution, there are people who have been employed into roles working specifically on different streams within the Entutor project. Um, and so they're responsible for making sure that the activities happen within the institutions themselves. But then we also, because we want to really enforce that sort of collaborative um, effort and to make sure that we are all moving forward together. We then also have these cross-institution working groups which pick up on different elements of the work 
plan um, and bring the appropriate people together to actually work and, and, and share, figure out what everybody else is doing um, and make sure that we're all sort of moving vaguely in the same direction. So that's sort of how things are working operationally. If I go up the way then, I have the, the end tutor steering board. As I said, we meet once a month, mammoth meetings. Um, the, the steering board is made up of our seven institutional leads, plus a representative from Thea, and that's Sean, who was meant to be here today. Um, plus, there were um, a number of people who were involved in the design of the project from very early on. And I think of them as being, well, I used to call them the memory of the project or the elders of the project, but some people didn't like that. I don't think a road liked that. <laughs> so now I'm just thinking, they're the visionaries. You're a visionary. I thought senators was the Senators, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, thank you. But then, but then we get into the reporting bit. And, uh, oh boy, that's a whole other area. Um, so I interface directly with both our higher education authority through whom the money is channeled, and they are monitoring. I mean, I meet with the HEA. Um, I have a regular meeting every two weeks and other meetings that come up in between. And they're the ones who send me, you know, the reporting templates, the reporting schedule. They come back and say, actually, that report's not good enough. We want a better report. You have to do more on this. We want the reports on that. We want, here's a new report we want you to work on. Um, and it's just constant reporting demands, which is only right. It's a lot of money. We have to be able to show what we're doing with it. And then I also have to report in the president's group because this is the president's project. So I'm talking about the presidents of the institutions and they have the final say basically on, on everything that happens. Um, so that group is convened by the HEA and I report into it and they meet um, four times a year. And they have to do all of the approval, etc. So it's, it's complicated. Okay. I'm just going to talk you through our three work streams just so you get a, a sense of the type of activities that are going on. I have to say, I do have a master plan. It's all documented in lots of Excel sheets. It hurts my brain to think about it as a whole. Um, it's, it's a very, very complicated work plan. There's a whole lot happening. So we've got three streams. I mentioned them already. And in each stream, we've got three work packages. So in stream one, which is around learner empowerment, I'm not going to go into the work package. I'm going to tell you about some of the things that we've been doing. We launched a collection of staff student fellowship projects. Um, basically, we put out a call back in, I think, January this year um, for collaborative projects which were to enhance staff student uh, collaboration. Um, and we announced those projects, 131 of them across the sector, and, and those are ongoing at the moment. We have recruited 100 student champions across our sector under the different themes, and they are working with, um, with the teams, with the end tutor teams within institutions on different projects, which will be local projects, local to the institution. We have a green paper on micro-credentials in the TU sector about to come out quite soon, within the next couple of weeks, I hope. We have got a, a sectoral digital backpack, which is about to be launched, which will offer a number of shared opportunities for digital badges, which might be co-curricular or extracurricular for all students, but we're going to focus specifically on first-year students for the next uh, semester, for reasons which will become very obvious in a few minutes. Um, and we're also working on um, a student competency or graduate attributes framework for the sector. Thank you. Second stream is around um, staff capabilities. The types of things we've been doing is a community of practice, which is a gathering of people who are engaged in developing um, staff capabilities within their institutions. We've launched a series of master classes. Those are open, they're, they're webinar based. Um, anybody can attend those and sign up to those. There's a curriculum framework under development, an associated toolkit for staff, and also each institution is doing um, a training needs analysis within their, their own institution, and, and hopefully we'll be able to compare um, outcomes across that. And then under the digital ecosystems place, uh, space, um, the first part of that is around the provision or enhancement of systems to support assessment and academic integrity. Um, and that also includes quite a large piece around the training and development for staff and students around academic integrity, and now with a specific focus on artificial intelligence. We're looking at improved infrastructure within our classrooms um, for hybrid learning, thank you, digital media production, open badges, digital badges, uh, video, um, enhanced access to digital library resources, which is something that this sector in particular has been sadly lacking, um, and the introduction of a series of pilots across the sector. 
very quickly before I finish up. By the end of April 2024, which is less than a year away, what do we have to achieve? We have to demonstrate that we have engaged 4,000 staff members um, in activities related to NTutor. Um, and that's, that's um, quite a task. At the moment, we're, we're, just, we're just over 2,000. Um, but you'll know yourselves that it's, it will be the first 2,000 that, that are easier to engage. It's the next 2,000 which will be more challenging. And we have to engage or, or demonstrate that we have engaged 9,600 students in activities related to NTutor, which is about 12% of the student population across the, the sector. Um, and that's why we're focusing on first-year students. And I would just like to thank my steering board and Grode, who's on the steering board, Nice picture of them. This is from our fellowship's launch. They're all listed on the slides. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't smack you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Okay, so now we have time for questions. What time is it now? Ah, it's two. We've got full 15 minutes for questions. Thank you, Sharon, for keeping time. Um, we can do the Vivox thing if people want to um, engage with it there or I can run up and hand a mic to somebody in the room who might want to ask a question. So we have questions from any of the... Well, I might take advantage of my position here as chair. Oh, okay, there's the output is great. Mock-ups to show options. Okay, so this is for this team. Um, what time frame do you allow for the design, development, and... And I think this is a theme that goes across, right? This notion that we've got time scales and the work required to do the thing. So you want to come up and, and speak to uh, what you allow for design and things? I don't know which one of us is going to take this. Okay, um, so I suppose linked to, to time frame, we, we tend to take a three month development of a course plus a month for QA, sometimes that leads through, but that's, that's a sort of average number or what we aim for, at least. Um, what's probably more important is the fact that we don't have a set amount of media pieces per course. So it is something that varies depending on the needs or wants of the academic and of the course itself. But yeah, I'll, I'll chuck over to you, Lucy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I ju just before I read that question, I thought, they're going to ask about time frames. I knew it. Ah. Um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why we justified this kind of remote thing rather than, you know, flying people over and saying, we've got, we've got two weeks with you. you know, be, now, it's attractive to do that. In reality, if you, you know, I, I really feel quite strongly that if you, let's get real, you know, the academics don't tend to, that doesn't tend to happen no matter how much you say. Right, so we design stuff in order that we can do it in a kind of more flexible and agile way. Um, but, I mean, you know, we work in parallel with the learning design. So we don't, so, so for example, it's learning design through media. So it's usually one to two pieces per module in a course. And, uh, yeah, three, three months, you know, with one lead media producer. Um, uh, one lead media producer, and then we have a wider team that will help with that. He'll be leading on another project on another course. But email me if you want more details. I'm happy to have a chat. I wanted to ask my question about, yeah. what was the phrase that you uninvested. used? Uninvested academics. And it, it's related also to the point that you made, Sharon, about you, you, the goal is to engage like 4,000. The first two you're pretty confident about. And I think this is going to what Peter Bryant was talking about in his session yesterday about what, what you really have to work with is that like 50% in the middle who are kind of neither here nor there. So I wonder if all of you could, could speak to that, that uninvested, like what are your strategy? What are you doing? Are you just abandoning people who are uninvested or how do you, how do you get them to come along? I'll, I'll go, but I'll keep it brief because I'd like to hear from you actually. Um, so that's where the specialisms come in, I guess. So it's not about saying, you do it this way, it's our way or the highway, it's developing that relationship and working out what's going to suit them. And through experience, you, there's a kind of sweet pot spot which is just outside of their comfort zone, um, and uh, that's, that tends to be what you do. It's very incentivizing to see what, other, for, to see what peers have done, yeah. and not to show, not blah on. So show the difference, because it's actually quite compelling if 
they, it doesn't always work, let's face it, but you know, that's what we, that's what we try and do. Do you want to? I'm sorry, I'm looking at the questions that are coming up. <laughs> yeah, look, this is, this is the perennial question. I mean, so I'm not going to tell you how old I am today, but let's just say I've been around for a long time and I've worked in staff development for probably close to 20 years. And this is such a challenge. Um, because, and, and we have these conversations, you know, you, you run workshops, you organise activities, and it's always the same faces, the same people that are there all the time. And we talk about having our, you know, our digital champions or our champions who are, who are going to, you know, share what they've been doing and share the work. And yet there is still this group that is so, so very difficult to, to, um, to reach. Um, and so I suppose, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't have the answers. What I will tell you is um, you need to meet them where they're at and meet them where, where their challenges are. So, for example, I mentioned the masterclasses which we've been running, which are online webinars. And uh, the, the approach that has been taken is each one is on a, a different theme of our, of our end tutor program. So it probably doesn't surprise you that the one about... Um, artificial intelligence in academic integrity was of most interest and drew in the most people um, in terms of, of you know, sign-ups and, and people who actually attended. And that's because it's something that matters to people now they're struggling with it. So that's what I mean by meeting people and that's one of the reasons why that, um, that needs analysis is being done um, across the sector. It's to find out rather than us deciding what do you need to know it's tell us where you're struggling, tell us what you need, and then we'll work with you on that. And, and so that's, that's the approach that we've been taking. And that feels like a gateway too, because as soon as you're truly useful to somebody, yes. then, you, then you can pitch the more sort of out there, have you ever considered, right? So that's the relationship building thing, yes. right? If, you're, if you are people who are useful to them, instead of, you know, an abstract webinar out there. That's, that's a gateway in. Mm -hmm. um, there's questions here about some of the integration and the strategy of Intuitor. I like how you said it was, you know, a room full of people and they came out, you know, with a plan after a month. But how, how is this strategy and the integration of, like, I think you have to be strategic in the integration of learning and technology. So how are you building that in retroactively? Is that what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I, think, I think that it has been, uh, in a sense, built in from the beginning. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious in terms of how, how it all happened. But there, there, there are obviously, I suppose one of the things that I struggle with currently is in my role as, as that sort of, um, you know, sort of trying to keep an eye on what's happening on the ground within the project and in the institutions and, and, and making sure that the work plan is happening. At the same time, I'm trying to report. And the thing is, when I'm reporting to the HEA, I have to report things, um, you know, in their silos. So I have to report, well, um, this is how we're progressing on all of the activities in, in Work Package 1.2, and this is how we're progressing on everything in Work Package 3.1. But that's not how it works on the ground, right? Because they are all integrated, and we can see the, the overlaps between um, the different elements. And that's why it's so important, for example, with the steering group, to bring them together and to allow them the space. I mean, I know a six and a half hour meeting sounds horrendous, but it is so important and so valuable to give them the space to have those conversations. And, and now we're trying to build in some extra opportunities where, you know, if you're sitting in a steering meeting like that and you're one of the institutional leads, you're probably focusing on one area of the work package or one area of the, the, the meeting that you're currently dealing with and maybe details about other aspects are just kind of passing you by and then you get a request two weeks later and you're thinking what the heck is that I, I don't know what that's about and it's very difficult for people to have that overall sense of everything that's happening but that I see as part of my role I have to I have to be there to have that oversight and to see where the connections are and, and how we can do that I'm curious about the reporting that you all are doing once the work is done and you know it's there do you have regular showcases? Do you have some way of saying to people, I mean, I'm assuming you do, this is not yes or no. How do you communicate what's possible based on what's been done before or what people might want to do? Not me. <laughs> You've been nominated, come on. <laughs> 
I got that. even that more. <laughs> um, we yeah we show we we show people. Um, what do we do? We have um, we don't have an external facing website, and I think that would really make the difference. I was thinking about dashboards for Sharon's thing, but some kind of showcasey. Yeah. If you want to know what we do, that yeah. you know, almost like a, a trailer or an yeah. advert or something. Yeah, and then we have lot. I mean, we do have lots of. We've we've been pulling together. What's really lovely and what seems to work really well is get. We have a we have a piece with those two academics that you heard there talking about the work, and then of course we would intersperse it with the content, and the the priority being. The, showing people that it's about working out what's the best tool for the job um, while, without actually explicitly saying that, rather than, look, we can do audio or we can do imagery. So we kind of go for that approach um, and we share examples, but we have to be careful because it can become prescriptive because yeah. then they go, oh, well, I want to have a Lego Formula One. We, you know, you're like, well, that's well, not going to really work in particle <laughs> physics or whatever, but, you know, yeah. There is a question here, I oh, dread these questions, about future-proofing. Um, I'm happy for you to push back against the notion of future-proofing, but is, is that something that is on the radar? Is that something that you have discussions about in terms of the, the digital ecosystem that you all are working within or trying to put together? Like what, what's on your minds around, around the future-proofing piece of it? <coughs> Yeah. We, yeah, thanks. Reusability. And um, if there's any, we spend a lot of time sort of justifying our roles rather than sort of thriving, if that makes sense. I've just been aware that that's live, being live streamed. But um, I think that's part of the, there's the culture in the UK a little bit at the moment. So rather than talk about the things that are a no-brainer to us and really get us sparkly, are, um, you know, make content that is accessible and it will be reused for a long time and accessibility is good design it's human ex you know it's user experience it's all those things and we design for um you know we aren't an oer university yet but we design as if we are and it justifies the investment this is to go across all sorts of courses you know not just the one it was originally made for so that's basically have i answered that yeah yeah i think it's so I think it doesn't really matter what the ecosystem is. Um, you know, if the VLE dies tomorrow and something else takes its place, what we've created up to this point still lives and it still has a place. Um, it, can st it can still live there. It doesn't matter what's built around it. Sure, I suppose um, um, with Entutor, we're, we're sort of talking about a different scale and that there's a number of... Um, uh, challenges, I suppose, that, that, that spring to mind. Um, first of all, we're, we are trying to move together as a sector, but we have to acknowledge that each of our institutions is, you know, already has an existing ecosystem when it comes to digital, and we can't just, you know, railroad over that. We have to build on what's already there. So what we are trying to do, for example, is to learn from each other. So, you know, if, if, if one institution is particularly strong in one area, has a lot of experience, we're trying to share that experience. So in that sense, we are trying to uh, future-proof the, the system. As well as that, the second challenge is the very short time frame, um, two years, um, and then the money's gone, right? Um, and so that notion of future-proofing can be quite difficult because you know, going from, you know, nearly 40 million to, to zero. Um, obviously, we're talking about sustainability and longevity and ongoing licenses and, and all of that sort of thing. So we do have to, to think about that and keep that in mind. Um, and the last thing that I will mention is that where we are looking at joint procurement of systems, we are really making an effort, a very strong effort, to include all voices a diversity of stakeholders and to make sure that we are doing it properly and in an ethical way, despite the time challenges. Um, and, and it is a balance. So we're, we're very conscious of it, um, but, but there are many challenges to it. So I'll, I'll probably leave it at that. No, that's great. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panel. Please thank them.